Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We are delighted to welcome Judy Human to Access Chat today. Judy has been working in the field for a very long time. I don't want to sound like I am leading a question about your age there, Judy. It didn't, didn't, that came out all wrong. Let's rewind. Uh, Judy, you're a, you, you know, you're a legend in the field. Uh, bumped into you at a, a couple of events before. Uh, your reputation absolutely precedes you. Um, and most recently, I've read your report for the Ford Foundation. So I, I think it was that report that you know, prompted us to go, God, you know what? We've still not had Judy on the show. So welcome. It's a real honor to have you here with us on Access Chat. Thank you Thank for joining you us. Can much. you tell us a little bit about your 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 journey into the uh, the accessibility world. Well, I guess, you know, I'm going to be, it's hard for me to say this too, I'm going to be 72 in December of uh, wow. 2019. So I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, kind of reminiscing that uh, when myself and many others started getting more active, we were like in our 20s. And so, you know, we were considered the, the anarchists of what was going on at that time. Now, many decades later, uh, we're no longer the youngest ones in the room, but they're great young people in the room who are really, in the United States, uh, they're called the ADA generation. So I had polio in 1949. I'm a post-polio quadriplegic, and meaning I don't walk, um, used to use crutches and braces, but never walked independently. I use a motorized wheelchair. And uh, accessibility for me in, in a very broad use of the term accessibility is something that's always been an issue. And so I would say that over the course of my life, some of the major changes regarding the built environment really is that we now have laws in the United States at the national level and state level uh, which require both physical accessibility and growing access into the IT world. And um, as one who started doing international work really in 1972, because I went to the Paralympics in uh, Heidelberg, not as a sports person, but as a tourist with the team, US team, and really began to learn at that time about what conditions for disabled people were like around the world. My parents were Jewish, my parents came from Germany and we lost a number of family members in the Holocaust. So um, I've always had an interest in international issues because my family, you know, was mainly not from the United States. Some people didn't speak English, others spoke English well. But the kinds of discrimination that I have faced over the course of my life, uh, in part based on the fact that we didn't have laws in the United States, like most countries at that time did not have laws that um, made it illegal to discriminate against one who had a disability, meaning that access to education could be limited, which was in Brooklyn when I grew up, the principal wouldn't allow me to go to the school that my brothers went to, didn't get to go to school till I was like nine, in a regular school, but in segregated classes, and um, learned to become an advocate as I was growing up based on the advocacy that my parents had to do in order to uh, help me gain access to basic things like education. So, you know, for me, it's kind of been incremental, and one thing I've recognized and always really um, adhered to is the fact that well, I face discrimination, so do millions of other disabled people. And ultimately, what we need to be ensuring is that all of us with disabilities and families and allies um, feel that we have the right to speak up and speak out and to demand what others are getting in their communities and to also be able to work with others in the communities to demand broader changes that impact society overall a little bit of a beginning of a nutshell. Judy, um, I, I uh, have known about your work and met you many times and been on stage with you too, an amazing speaker. And I always am a little starstruck around you because you have just 
you've been an amazing leader. As a matter of fact, I was blessed to have you on my show, Human Potential at Work, and I reminded you where I first met you, which you would never have remembered, but when I first got into the field, I went to an event I remember so well on September 10th in the uh, in DC at the World Trade the Reagan World Trade Center in DC, which is a block from the White House. And I remember hearing you speak and getting to meet you and just being giddy about meeting the, the, you because you've done so much for the United States. Well, it's just true. Sorry to brag about you and for the world. But then, of course, I remember thinking I'm in the best place in the world. And then, of course, the next day was September 11th, uh, 2001, which um, the United States will never forget 9-11. So that helped me remember the first the day before I met Judy Human. But you were the honorable Judy Human, which is a very important title in the United States. And someday I want to be the honorable Deborah Rue. But right now I'm just Deborah Rue. But and well, let me just say such... one quick thing. on So the term honorable. Um, is because I had an appointment in the U.S. government under the Clinton administration, and the title honorable comes if you have a position that's been confirmed by the U.S. Senate. So right. that's why I have that title. So, so it's I a big deal. Don't use. Uh, I like to say, as somebody that, that, as we left the British Empire, you know, there's sirs yeah. and knights and all that stuff. That's that's our uh, nod to the, to right. the UK. Uh, but um, but Judy has a, a very, very, very impressive background. She has led the World Bank on these issues. She has worked with the Ford Foundation. She's worked with the Clinton administration, the um, Obama administration. Is that right? I mean, she's yes. – so tell us – so I'll stop gushing. Sorry. But, Judy, just give us a little rundown of your impressive background, and, and I'll, I'll stop gushing about you. But, I mean, really, we are so honored to have you on the program. So I've been really fortunate, and I, I mean that most sincerely, that I've, I guess, in some places been at the right, right place at the right time. Or, um, so my, my career really has uh, included working in what we call the nonprofit world for about 20 years, and then positions in U.S. government and the World Bank and state government and the U.S. Department of State. So what I've been able to do over the years is um, one of my, well, I, my first position was as a teacher in New York City where I taught elementary school and had to file a lawsuit against the Board of Education who had denied me the right to teach. So human versus the Board of Education, which was a case that ultimately settled outside of court, but I did teach for three years in elementary school. Then I went to the West Coast, California, to a city called Berkeley, uh, where there was an organization uh, being developed called the Center for Independent Living. Now uh, there are centers for independent living um, in many countries in Europe, in Europe there's something called the European Network on Independent Living. Um, in, in Japan, there's the Japanese, Coal uh, Japanese Council on Independent Living, and there's a new international organization that's been set up, which is the Worldwide Inde Centers for Independent Living organization. Um, I was able, through the work that I did, at CIL and then helping to set up an organization called the World Institute on Disability, uh, which was created by myself, a gentleman named Ed Roberts, who many people may know, who was a disability rights leader and also one of the founders of the Berkeley CIL and unfortunately passed away in the mid-90s. But Ed and I and a woman named Joan Leon started this organization called the World Institute on Disability which was the first public policy organization run by disabled people. And why we did that was because we felt that the voices of disabled people needed to be more prominently um, engaged in doing research, quality research from a disability perspective that could also have an impact on policy and budgeting. So I was with WID from the beginning until I left 
in 1993. Um, over that 20 year period, as I mentioned, I'd been doing work within the United States, um, organizing different organizations, something called the 504 demonstrations, a piece of uh, legislation in the United States that was quite pivotal. Uh, people who are interested in learning more about 504 could go to YouTube and look at something called the power of 504. And also there's a program in the United States that some people in other countries may have seen on Comedy Central um, called Drunk History. And if you don't like to hear cursing, you should not watch it. But if you don't mind cursing, it's, I think, a very uh, great piece, which uh, shows, it's an eight minute piece on the 504 demonstrations. 504 demonstrations were historic because it was a group of disabled people with all kinds of disabilities who came together across the United States to demand that the government sign a particular set of regulations to implement, which was at that point, the first major piece of legislation making it illegal to discriminate against someone based on their disability if the entity had gotten money from the federal government. It was a 26 or 27 day demonstration with 150 disabled people, the longest demonstration in US history. Um, so that was, I think, a pivotal point for many people in the US, certainly including me because it really enabled us to see that this was something that we had been working on for a number of years. I believe very fervently that the 504 regulations really were a critical part um, of rules and law that enabled the Americans with Disabilities Act to be developed because it dealt with many of the critical issues that needed to be uh, addressed like setting up a policy regarding new construction and what to do with buildings that were older and weren't compliant and many other things. So when President Clinton was elected and um, his administration was really the first administration that actively reached out to hire disabled individuals in positions of responsibility across the US government. And so I didn't know I was going to get a call um, to ask if I'd be interested in uh, pursuing one of those jobs. And when I did get the call, I um, there was one position and only one position that I was interested in. And people around the world won't understand what it exactly means, but it's like a deputy minister and in the Department of Education. And I had responsibility over three major components dealing with education, employment, and research in the area of disability. And I had the privilege of getting that job and working that job from 1993 to 2001. Um, what was important for me in that job was that my years of work um, at the local level in Berkeley, California, prior to that in Brooklyn, New York, um, then being able to do both domestic and international work really um, enabled me to have a breadth of knowledge that I wouldn't have had if I had just gone into government without any of this other experience. So I frequently will speak to younger people and say, I really believe government is essential. We need to have strong, fervent people working in government. But I also feel it's important that um, we have experience that we're bringing into government. Because once you're in government, regardless of the government, your role changes. And so um, you, you can't do the same kind of advocacy that you can do not being in government, but knowing about the role of advocacy. And for me, wanting to work with the strongest advocates when I was in government. So I looked for opportunities all the time to be able to bring people in who I felt were gonna be true and honest to what they believe needed to happen. Um, and I think that proved quite successful. Uh, in the United States, when one political party leaves, anyone who's got a political appointment generally leaves government also. Uh, so I left the administration in 2001 and then had the fortune of being able to go work with Jim Wolfenson, who at that time was the president of the World Bank and really 
a strong advocate on issues relating to disability. So over that period of time till 2007, we were able to really begin to, I want to underline begin, uh, to raise the issue of disability across the bank. And I think we were making some positive progress. Today, uh, Charlotte McLean and Clapo um, is the person leading the bank's disability work, and she's doing a fantastic job. And she also started working at the bank when I was there as a result of some funding that Mr. Wilkinson had given. Um, and so we were able, while I was at the bank, to also bring in some really dynamic disabled people, Charlotte being one, a woman named Rosangela Berman Beeler, who currently heads up the work at UNICEF, uh, Catalina Devandis, who currently is a special advisor on uh, disability, I'm sorry, the special rapporteur on disability at the United Nations. Those three women all came through the World Bank, amongst other things. So I think, you know, we really were very fortunate not only to bring disabled people in, but quite frankly, quite amazing that the disabled women who really have gone on to be leaders and need to say, you know, in the middle of this, you know, who am I, that um, issues around disability, type of disability, gender, sexual orientation, um, religion, all of those things, race, et cetera, uh, really have been an important part of the work that's emerging. And I think one of the uh, important components of what we've seen going on around the world is the voices of disabled individuals uh, from countries around the world that are really um, becoming stronger. People are organizing more, but they're facing huge challenges in countries with limited resources um, where governments, and I include the U.S. government in this, are not necessarily spending the amount of money that needs to be spent to really ensure that disabled people are integrated into the various programs that we're operating and supporting overseas. And I think that's part of the work that we've all been involved with is getting what I call a disability lens on the work that is being done uh, in the development field, human rights, philanthropy. Um, I worked in the Clint, uh, sorry, in the Obama administration as the first uh, senior advisor on international disability rights. And um, there had been a woman who had been working at a state, not in this position, but in a, another position named Stephanie Ortaleva who now has gone on to set up an organization called Women Enabled. Um, and when when I came in, what we were really, um, under Secretary Clinton, we were really, again, looking at similar work that we had done at the World Bank to really get the issue of disability raised because as everyone listening to this program who knows anything about disability, it's still such a marginal issue. And people are afraid to discuss it. They're afraid they don't know enough. And in many cases, they don't. And so it's an issue of allowing people to recognize that from an international perspective, the issues of human rights and justice and equality, equity, are critically important. And that we have a responsibility to learn about what we don't know. It's certainly certainly not just in the area of disability. And um, when I left uh, the Obama administration and offered to do some work by the president of the Ford Foundation, um, Dar Darren Walker. Um, it's been a privilege, you know, to work with him. And let me just say that I think one of the next really important things that are happening is that through the leadership of Darren and the Ford Foundation, they have now begun to work with other foundations in the United States to become more inclusive disability. Now, this is not going to happen overnight, but there's a President's Council, which has been set up, which right now has 15 foundations involved, uh, being led by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Ford Foundation. So I think, you know, we're opening doors. It's, it's pretty tragic, I feel, in the year 2019, that we are in a place where other groups were 20, 30 years ago. And I think, you know, that's a really critical issue that um, we, we can't continue to be on the sidelines and wait for things to slowly happen. I think one of the reasons I was interested in doing this program today 
is because it is going to people around the world and learning from people around the world about the struggles they're facing, the successes that we're facing, and where we need to go, I think is critical. And you know, finally, the report that I was able to do for the Ford Foundation, uh, changing the face of disability in media, um, was very important because media is, as everyone knows, um, consuming such a huge part of how people get information. And the continued absence of disability is one which really um, hampers our ability from the most local level to the global level to really be able to allow people to understand the critical importance of including those of us who have disabilities and to be able to be creating a society those who will acquire disabilities um, through violence and war and natural causes uh, to be able to make the contributions that for so long people felt we couldn't make. I think people now really do recognize that um, even though they're not necessarily doing what needs to be done, they recognize that what people thought in the past is not true and that we are as disabled individuals with all kinds of disabilities able to make contributions that can help improve our communities, including the economic development of our world. Oh, well said, absolutely. Um, you've listed a bunch of people during that last few minutes that, that we not only admire, but we've also had on as, as guests on Access Chat. So, so we're, we're, we're familiar with some of the, uh, some of the people like Charlotte McLean, Ngalapo from the World Bank, she, she was, came on a couple of years ago and, and actually she was in Brazil when I first right. came across you um, at, the, at the IPC <laughs> summit. Um, I think the the stuff, uh, the portrayal in the media is, is really, really important. It's how you get mind share and everything else. Oh, and, and yes, Deborah's right. We are also um, very proud of the fact that we serve as board members of the organization that you helped found. So Deborah and I both sit on the board of WID. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, I know that. So, so there you go. Uh, yes. Um, so, oh, another so, thank you. <laughs> yes, so 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 thank you for um, you know setting up something that we we are now proud to be involved in. Um, but but essentially the the portrayal in the media is really important. Um, and uh, what I find interesting is that that I, we we also work with the BBC on on stuff, uh, um, and that they are really taking it very seriously. And and the British broadcasters have set up a sort of evaluation method method, yes. that, uh, a diamond methodology for inclusion in the media. Is that something that you've seen elsewhere? Well, certainly not in the United States. Um, in, in our paper, we mention this because I think BBC um, Great Britain has really done some uh, leading work on getting disability integrated into the media. And it's, it's kind of interesting because it's similar to work that we do not in media but you know, affirmative action or whatever you want to call it um, in government programs and having real objectives that need to be met. We don't have that in media here in the US. And uh, when I was over in England last year and met with people from the BBC and Channel 4, it was um, very exciting to learn about the history of how these issues have been progressing, and equally importantly, about the fact that there is this requirement that not just disability, but across the diversity uh, angle in Great Britain has to be a part of what's going on in media. If we had that, I think that would be really, you know, very important and could help us move forward more rapidly. We don't, and I doubt we ever will. But um, we definitely look to what's going on um, very favorably and to use it as example of the progress that you're making and how disabled people are being integrated into everything. I know that people don't feel it's enough yet, but when we look at what we have here, you're right, it's not enough, but oh my goodness, it's so much more than we have here now. Antonio, you raised a point. 
Yes, I do, because you know, never, never uh, in in history it was so easy and cheap to create to to create media. Now, today uh, we have channels uh, that you can you know, like we are doing it here today. I wouldn't be able to be here with you today with Neil and Deborah because you know I don't see any TV channel bringing us on board to record anything with us. So uh, there's a good number. Seeing that there's a good number of independent media's all, all over the United States, some of them are uh, they only exist in digital. They are, they are not in the old in the in the legacy uh, networks. What do you think is is stopping uh, this new media to bringing people to bring to hiring people to, to, with disabilities to make them forward? What is uh, uh, stopping them from doing it? Um. I would say there's really nothing stopping them, but it's not yet happening. Why it's not yet happening, I can't specifically say, but I presume they're either not meeting people who can become a part of what's going on, or they're rejecting people um, that want to participate. And I think that's really um, an, an ongoing issue of and also ensuring that we have people who are qualified to do these jobs. But I think, you know, every field is always looking at how to grow the competence and knowledge of people moving into the field. Um, but I, I think from what you can see here in the U.S., there still are barriers of people being able to get jobs in these industries. What do you see is going on um, in Great Britain? Oh, similar. Um, I, I I think that that that, that um, it, like in the in the traditional media, you've definitely got the um, the clear targets, not just in front of camera but behind camera as well. So organisations like BBC, Channel Four, they are proactively including people in their training and recruitment programs, going out and and, and actually developing specialist recruitment programs to include people with disabilities. I think that where we have the non-traditional media, um, people are blogging, people are posting, um, but it's that sustainability. It's the and when I talk, I'm not talking financing. about the environmentally. Yeah, the financing, the the effort that it takes to maintain it. Uh, and, and, and you know, Antonio, I know you've got a point you want to make. So no, and I think uh, that no, there are organisations like. The Business Disability Forum and My Purple Space who try to talk uh, about uh, these topics outside the normal networks. Okay, this is not just a group of people with disabilities talking with people with disabilities for people with disabilities. And in UK, I see that conversation happening. And and what in other in, and tell yeah. me what were the names of the organisations? Uh, Business Disability Forum and My Purple Space. Uh, what I, what I, uh, in, in fact, my, myself, Deborah, and Neil, when we started this on Twitter, we started to realize many organizations are talking with, within themselves, and sometimes are talking within their own spaces. Okay. Exactly. So people who, who for some, who, 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 who in wheelchairs, they talk with their own group. They don't talk with other groups. And, and, and it goes on. And then when they organize a, a, an event, a summit or a discussion, is between them. Nobody else is in there. So I, I yeah. And that's I think that's a, that's an issue. We need to talk about these topics at where we talk about technology, where we talk about social issues. That's where the conversation needs to happen. And I think here it's slowly happening, and I know it's happening where you are also, but. Um, how to make it happen more rapidly. I think, you know, this week um, the Obamas have a deal with Netflix. They've started a production company and they're financing six films, six documentaries, and one of them is called Crip Camp and it's being uh, produced um, by three people, one of whom is a disability rights activist from the field. And his name is Jim Lebrecht, or as I call him, Jimmy Lebrecht. Um, but one thing that he's been doing over the last number of years and others 
with organizations like Sundance um, is really going to those events, dealing with problems of basic accessibility. But the reason they want to participate is exactly what you're saying, Antonio. They want to be a part because they're professionals in a field, and they want to be meeting people who are working in the field, most of whom will not have disabilities, most of whom will be individuals that um, they can learn from and share information with. And I think there is a little opening now that people are seeing um, the need to look at how to do a better job. But it's the same thing as, you know, at the Department of Education, at the Department of State, at the World Bank, on and on. This absence exactly as you've been discussing it. You know, people speaking to ourselves, we're in an echo chamber, um, and the echo chamber doesn't help us. And I think also, you know, one of the critical issues, and we looked at this in the paper that I wrote, um, is we went to speak to other organizations that were representing other diversity communities. So like the Center on Asian Americans in Media, GLAD, which is LGBTQ community, Black Media, et cetera, to talk to them and say, okay, um, how are you integrating disability into the work that you're doing? And of course, in most cases, the answer was, we're not. And um, that's another very big area that we're trying to enable these other organizations that are very much focused, for example, on storytelling to identify people from within their communities who also have disabilities, visible and invisible disabilities. The stories are so rich. And um, I, I mean, I think in the next three to five years, if we can get this, um, if we can get more momentum going, I think we will begin to see uh, some more important changes. But again, I think, you know, the absence of disability for children, for example, and parents, and people who are going to acquire their disabilities when they're older, is it's more than just the absence, because the absence means that we feel like we're invisible. And so I think this is a very important discussion, Antonio, that you're raising. No, and uh, to that, uh, I, about uh, two weeks ago, I was at the uh, um, uh, organization uh, not far from Cork, who supports uh, people in wheelchair. and. I went there, it was quite far from the city center. They have a, a really nice building, great facilities, but they are unreachable to anyone else. So nobody can, it's very difficult for anyone to go there because they are in the middle of a really nice property. So w w when they leave their homes, they all go there, they network in that place, they have their coffee, but they are completely out of the, of the city environment. So if they were, let's say, in, in the, have a location in the middle of the city, they could just go and, you know, and face all the obstacles and people start with, well, maybe we need to change something in the city. Maybe I need to change the door of my coffee shop. But no, they are somehow isolated in that really nice place. Mm. Wonderful. But then, you know, it uh, goes back to your, we just finished, you know, uh, how we make people more visible in, you know, uh, all the time, not just <laughs> when we are trying to bring them uh, uh, to the attention and improve uh, the work we're doing. But I think, you know, that kind of a discussion is important. You know, why are people not doing that? You know, what are the barriers? And they're not just necessarily physical barriers, but in many cases, it could be transportation and also just people's emotional uh, feelings, you know, are they, do they, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but I think learning how to be able to become more integrated into society is something that we need to be conscious of. And like in California, in Berkeley, when we were able to finally get um, accessible buses, we recognized that there were many people, including myself, who had never been on a bus. And I actually was afraid of going on a bus. I was afraid of going on a bus more because I was afraid what would happen if I got lost or what would happen if the bus broke down? What would people think? 
what happens if it takes me longer to get on the bus, blah, blah, blah. You know, this whole, you know, feeling like you're, you're, you're standing out and you're a negative. So we got a bus to come to the organization, the Berkeley Center for Independent Living, which was a non-residential organization. We had a bus come a number of times and we actually worked with people, including myself, getting on and off the bus so that we understood what the bus was like. And the culmination of all this is really funny because the first time I took a bus, the bus broke, no. the lift broke. And I was completely, like, internally, I didn't show anything externally. Like, oh, my God, I can't believe it happened. And the driver just said to me, you know, ma'am, buses break down all the time. This happens to be the lift. It is no big deal. And that was so important to me to have this nice bus driver who, like, completely got it. Because everybody had to get off the bus. I couldn't get off the bus. But I, I think, Antonio, is a really important point, and we need to really – acknowledge it and, and deal with it more. Thank you, Judy. It's been a real pleasure. Our half hour has flown uh -huh. by. Um, I just need to actually um, say thank you to Barclays Access, Microlink and MyClearTech to support us to keep this show on the road. Um, without them, we'd be the bus breaking down. So um, Thank you once again. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I'm sure we're going to interact again. I've just sent you a little note with those those things on. Um, thank you, and we look forward to you joining us on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Great show. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao. <laughs> Be the same. <laughs>